Okay, we're on. Hey, how are you? Give you a few minutes to hop on and um, also share this with your friends uh, on your Facebook. Or your uh, enemies. Yeah, <laughs> wherever, wherever you're tuning in from. So we'll, we'll just give you a minute here and, and to do that and um, uh, share it as, as, as far out as you want to share it. So. <laughs> yeah, so I see Abby's on, Stephanie's on. All right. Just about. Going. Isabel. Yep. Yeah. John Goodman. Hi, John. How's it going? I'm Laura. <laughs> Hello, Laura. Media. Hello, media. Right on. And Addie is on. Okay. Good to see you. All. I haven't seen Addie forever. <laughs> Stephanie. Okay. That looks like a mess. It look. It is a mess. This this looks really good up up here, but down here it's like kind of a got cord, wires running everywhere. Mess. <laughs> so. Yep. So what's going on, Jen? On COVID day. 1,000. Well, um, we're going to come to a sudden end, and it just keeps looking like doors are just about ready to burst, start bursting more and more and more. Um, I love the things I'm seeing across the nation. Certain certain things are opening up. Mm -hmm. I know you and I were, were trying to figure out where in California we can um, uh, post-celebrate our anniversaries, you know, since lockdowns not can't quite yeah. go anywhere. Um, and so we're, we're taking aim, uh, hopefully in a few weeks, next month, and we're going to um, maybe, maybe celebrate fly, right. <laughs> maybe you should fly to Georgia because they're could, opening up. Okay. So we could go to Georgia, right? Yeah, Georgia of all places. Good food. Good food, yeah. I was yeah. there not too long ago. Good, great food. There you go. So, um, so how about you? How am I doing? Yeah. Doing good. Staying busy. We're doing a lot of, I think we're pretty much doing something on each of our campus, some sort of remodeling or some sort of something, whatever. Right. So I figured, hey, you know, we got COVID, so might as well remodel every campus. Yeah, well, or in your downtime, so. In our downtime. So pretty much every campus we have something going on. Right. So, uh, but this Sunday's Mother's Day. Yeah. So Jen's preaching again. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if you guys were watching last Sunday, but the fire sprinklers came on. Just because she was on fire. Oh my gosh! Anyway, so, <laughs> so but almost. I had, quite I, had a lot, I had a lot to. I had a lot of things pent up. Yeah, so. yeah. So anyway, so she. We're trying to get get it all out of her, so she'll be on again this Sunday. <laughs> right. But we're doing something really um, special, actually. So we're going to, uh, just like last week, I'll be on again at eight forty, and also ten forty a.m. before each of the services, before the online services and just do a Facebook Live and do some Q&A and just pray with one another. And a bunch of you jumped on last Sunday, and, and uh, I really enjoyed it, and I, I know many of you did also. It's just a great time to interact and pray with one another. So I'll be doing that again this Sunday at 8.40 and 10.40. And then after the services, after the second online service this Sunday, between 1 p.m. and 2 p.m., we're actually going to do a drive-through, uh, not a drive-in, but a drive-through uh, at our ministry center parking lot across the street from our downtown campus. And uh, this is for all the moms. So mm -hmm. we have a gift for you uh, that we want to give you as you drive through the parking lot at the, at the downtown campus ministry center uh, this Sunday between 1 and 2. So guys, bring your uh, wives and moms and yeah. just, mm -hmm. or even if, you know, you're not a mom, ladies. Just drive through anyway. Why so, not? <laughs> that's right. So we, so we have stuff we want to give you, and it's just a great excuse to see you, right? All right. So you can stay in your car as you drive by. We'll hand you something, and uh, it'll be fun. So this Sunday at 1 p.m., 1 till 2. So someone said, oh, so are we having an in-person service? Not quite yet, but stay tuned, okay? Oh, we're uh, having one sooner very than later. sooner. <laughs> so I'm telling you, if I was to do some remodeling, it would be like right now. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, but you're remodeling. The one thing I, I've been interested in is the remodel of the bathrooms, you know, and, and so what does that entail? Uh, well, we're just making it look pretty. Pretty, so okay, okay. New, new tiles and fixtures yeah. and stuff like that. All right, good. You know, always improving those things. Yeah, nothing, nothing like, you know, humongous. Okay. But huge in the sense of it's going to look totally different. Very good. So, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, something that's been really on my heart, uh, you know, coming into this week, a few, a few things is that, and I, I shared this Sunday, is um, this is kind of a, a in intercession. You're going to feel the bursting open 
type feeling, uh, you know, and so prayer is probably going to be pretty intense this week. Uh, probably um, for some of you, there might be a sense of travail, and that's usually the final push before, you know, everything, you know, uh, it's like the final push, and it's the, the, the final uh, prayer you need to see things begin to open. So um, at least uh, for those of you who are connected to us, um, connected to this house, you're probably going to get that sense, those of you who are intercessors. Uh, so I just want to let you know, you know, that's very much in line with what's happening uh, right now. I'll probably um, do a little bit later after this live at some point. I'll probably do something on travail just to give you a, a heads up on that and what, what, what that could look like if that happens with you. Um, so I don't know if you have anything you want to you want nope. to bring in? I shared all my stuff. Okay, all right. So, um, and then finally, um, uh, it's really important to begin, you know, if you haven't already, um, to really ask the Lord for what you want, okay? A lot of us, we want to, to get angry and complaining, and this isn't happening, our kids aren't in school, and there's no graduation. Well, have you thought about collectively asking Him for that? Um, a lot of times we defer to, to the no, forgetting that it's God who opens doors, it's God who opens schools, it's God who opens churches. Everything we have comes from Him, and He's the one who opens and shuts and holds the keys. And so we want to actually ask Him for what we want, okay? Yeah. And, and instead of, you know, deferring to everybody's no, and, you yeah. know, he's, he's a God who answers prayer, but we have to really, you know, Come, come after these things in faith and be diligent and recognize it's his hand that brings the blessing. The governor might say no, but the Lord has a yes. That's right. right? So, so that's why we're saying, you know, um, let's ask, okay? Mm-hmm. We're, we're asking for our churches to open, our businesses to open, our schools to open, our graduations to be reinstated. You know, we're asking for these yeah. things and we're not relenting. And the Lord cares about those things. And so, um, you know, he's the one who brings the answer. So let's go after that, yeah. okay? All right. Um, question number one. Hi, I want to grow in faith for healing prayers. What do you do to foster? You had that wrong finger up. Sorry. What that. do you do to foster that faith? Yeah. Just so in, in case you didn't see, she was pointing at the question, but it was the middle finger. And I took it very personal. Okay. All right. Let's do that again. <laughs> <laughs> Use the right finger this time. The index, right. index finger. Hi, right. I want to grow in faith for healing prayers. What do you do to foster that faith? Somebody asked that question. I think, you know, growing in any type of faith is, you know, faith grows in one way. I know many times people want to pray for more faith or ask others to lay hands on them so they could have more faith. But, you know, um, the Lord could give us a gift of faith, Mm -hmm. which comes on us and lifts off of us. And, and, you know, that's very different. But all of us, though, we can't depend just on the gift of faith to come on us. So we have to develop our faith. You know, Romans says to each one is given a measure of faith. So everyone has faith. Even people who aren't Christians, they have a certain amount of faith. They have enough faith to get saved, right? So everybody gets a measure of faith. But then you have to then grow the mm-hmm. faith that you have. So faith is growable, but it, and faith could also shrink. So in the way you grow your faith, Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. So it's the constant hearing of the word. So I think Jen was talking about this last week. you got to speak the word. you got to obey the word. Uh, those are ways to release your faith. But the way faith comes is the co- continual hearing of God's Word. And uh, if you want to grow your faith in a specific area, let's say, I think somebody mentioned healing. Right, if you want healing. To, if you want to grow your faith in the area of healing, find all the healing scriptures you can and start quoting them, start reading them, start... Uh, get it inside of get you. Get it inside of mm-hmm. you. Find healing, um, you know, teachings on healing. Uh, you know, people who are you know, teaching from the Word that it is God's will to heal you and and deliver you and just be listening to those over and over and over so it's about hearing it's the hearing of god's word that brings faith in it so when, when you hear god's word it's pregnant with the power and what's required to bring that promise to pass in your life so you gotta so the word is also like a seed so you put the seed of the word in your heart and you just continually water it by confessing and it grows absolutely and if you're interested in learning more about this and going you know uh, stewarding and, and uh, putting some time aside for this kind of teaching um, I'm actually going to do f- a, a life group on zoom I'll start it tonight mm-hmm. um, and sh- somewhere on the harvest page there is a link that you can actually you know you can sign up to get the zoom link 
um, to actually oh. enter into that class uh, tonight. So um, just FYI, and it's, it's just about healing. That's mm -hmm. really what it's about. I think it's, uh, I, I had planned to do this way before COVID, and I was like, we've got to do a healing class. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, now's the time to do it because uh, we want to have our faith in place before before we run into a situation that challenges right. challenges the Word of God. Uh, number two here says, Pastor Ron, when can we expect a book from you and what will it be about? I'm hoping hmm. healing or some of your supernatural experiences. Ah. <laughs> well, I think we talked about this a few yes, weeks we back. Have. Yeah. Yeah, everybody keeps asking you. So, you know? so my answer back then was <laughs> um, ghost uh, Ghost I get a ghostwriter. <laughs> I used to want to write a book until I start watching her write books. I like, started my my number five uh, yeah. last night. So I'm I started like, last night. I'm not. I don't want to write a book anymore after watching her write books. Oh come on! <laughs> and uh, so, <laughs> but like I, I think I said when, right when this happened, one of the first ones. I've been contacted by a different couple different companies that want to offer ghostwriters to write something. So I might actually take them up on that. And uh, what will it be about? Uh, I have a couple of things in mind, so we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. Um, well, what about this? I could say so much on that one. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, the next question is, what is your take on spiritual parenting? Will you ever consider becoming spiritual parents for others if you're not currently? It's so funny. I was actually thinking through this whole concept this morning, and I hadn't even seen this question. So, you know, sometimes I think the Holy Spirit just prepare me for, for the question. Um, I, I love the idea of spiritual fathers and mothers. I, I love the concept, and I love the idea I think um, where we get where we see problems is in the application, because um, you know people always you know they want people to be their spiritual uh, father or mother uh, mm -hmm. with an expectation of a certain yeah. level of relationship with people that is that is not um, it's just not doable uh, you know and so so or um, some people they use that term uh, to to kind of hook you into relationship and it's it's a nice theoretical concept but you know you're, you're going to end up abandoning people because you can't emotionally um, you know you can't emotionally connect to them the way a true parent can and so I, I personally um, you know my husband can say you know explain his his end of it but I personally would rather be a spiritual mother rather than your spiritual mother only because I feel like it would create um, a false expectation and a, and a, um, perhaps a sense of abandonment when I'm not able to to be a real like a real mother to people the way that they might might expect or want. I'd rather be a spiritual mother, and I think that's more that's more doable and it's more palatable, and it and it puts the expectations where where they're realistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. Paul addresses that to the Corinthians. Mm -hmm. He says, you know, you've had many teachers, but not very many fathers. And, um, and I think that was part of the problem with the Corinthian church because they were a very powerful church, but very immature church. You know, they're the ones that lacked nothing in spiritual gifts, but they're the ones that were constantly being rebuked for their immaturity, for their divisiveness, mm -hmm. for all those things. And I believe some of that really was linked to their lack of having spiritual fathers uh, in the church, they had many teachers, which the word there in the Greek means tutors. Uh, it came from, an, from from the Greek language at that time, which was a word that, that was used for uh, when the Roman Empire would go in and conquer a nation, they would enslave a lot of the teachers from that nation, and then they would become tutors for the royalty uh, of the Romans. So, so it's that same word that was used. So basically, tutors, people who kind of help you with the word, but mm -hmm. they're but you don't have a sense of identity with them. So I think what Paul was addressing in Corinthians is. When we have a sense of identity, spiritual identity, with those who have either led us to the Lord or, or poured into our life, um, you know, it stabilizes us. I think we become healthier. You know, I think the same thing in the natural. Sometimes when we have, you know, father or mother issues, and or even yeah. know our parents are, you know, there's a wound many times that mm. you know certain things manifest in our life because of of that. And I think spiritually, it's also true. Things manifest in our life because of a lack of identity so I think it's important to have uh, to look to people as spiritual fathers and mothers but um, I wholeheartedly agree with what Jen said um, you know and, and just add to it like this because it is important I think for us to have uh, spiritual mothers and fathers 
but it's, uh, I think we get it backwards sometimes. I think we go to people and say, will you be my spiritual father or mother? And then we're expecting... <laughs> Until they tell us something we don't like. Exactly. You know? <laughs> or sometimes, and then how do you say no? It's like, no, I don't. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> but, kind of uh, awkward. But the thing is, though, and then we have an expectation sometimes, then now they're going to, uh, you know, like Jen was saying, spend all the time with us, pour all the stuff into us. I think a healthier way to look at it is... <laughs> Uh, you act like a son or daughter without expecting them to act like a father or mother. I think if you were to act like a son or daughter, I think a good spiritual father and mother eventually will act like a father and mother to you if you act like a son or daughter. Um, and, and I think that's the way I would do it. And, and so that what that means is there's a lot of people who could be your spiritual father and mother and they might not even know it. Uh, you know, I'm cognizant of the fact that, you know, we have a lot of people that go to our church. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have different campuses. We're start, about to start two more, which there'll be a lot of people I don't even know. Mm -hmm. But they might consider me their spiritual father just because maybe I led them to the Lord, maybe um, of what I, you know, put into them every week and stuff. Right. I might not even know it. But if they begin to, you know, act like sons or daughters and then they find my, you know, they find themselves in my world because, you know, they're serving, they're, fulfilling the call, mm -hmm. uh, they'll still get the benefits, I think, of that. But, um, you know, just to say somebody's your spiritual father and mother, I think that sets a certain expectation. I think the danger with that, I'm going along on this, it's okay. but the danger with that sometimes is then we start looking to that person instead of looking to the God to fulfill us or to find identity in us. Mm -hmm. So even if you have spiritual fathers and mothers, you just have to remember they never replace your relationship with God and what you need God to do in your life to bring that identity to you. Mm -hmm. Anyway, there's much more I could say. I know. It's just like that's a topic like you could just really go to town on mm -hmm. because, you know, I have I have um, witnessed, I have had um, spiritual fathers in my life. And then, um, you know, I some were long distance, some were close. And then some relationships just changed, you know, mm -hmm. and and I actually am not a person that necessarily needs a spiritual father. Like my identity is really secure, yeah. but I value it when it's there. And there are some people uh, in our lives that, you know, um, I, I'm thinking of one in particular, you know, that I know that I can go to at any time mm -hmm. and we could we could get, you know, we can get that kind of yeah. um, relationship you know, in the moment that we need it. And so, so I feel like it's there, um, but it's not something I'm looking for as, you know, because I, I, it almost seemed like it was popular for a while. Who's your mm -hmm. spiritual father or mother? I'm like, that's a great concept. It's just playing that out is not, is not necessarily. And then, when, and then when the relationship <laughs> changes, then we got a bunch of orphans. Yeah. So, so you know, it's just like, what's, what's yeah. reality here and what's realistic? Well, would you say it's the same or is it better to see someone as your apostle versus your father? It just depends on how it's defined, mm -hmm. um, and and different people and different groups define it differently. Uh, some groups, you know, you'll call somebody, you know, an apostle. It's it's a, it's respect. Mm -hmm. um, you know, certain cultures. It's culture, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's respectful. In other cultures, even though it's they are an apostle, they don't want you to call an apostle. Yeah. And it's for me, it's hard to navigate because I'm in like very different cultures between. So all the white different... people do not want you to call them apostles. Well, no, I've seen it across. I'm I'm I've kidding. seen it across the no, board. It's, it's not just that kind of culture. It's no. just the culture of the church. Yeah, I've yeah. seen it across the board. You know, but then the strong honor cultures, and often that is mm -hmm. ethnic. You know, yeah. you will call apostle, and like if you don't, like some, like you will be looked at funny, mm -hmm. not by the necessarily the apostle, but the people around him. Like, what, what are you doing? Don't lower that, don't lower that man or woman. Now, do you think that's also generational, or no? I don't know. I don't know. You know, for a long time we heard it was generational, where you know, quote the younger didn't have the same honor or respect. I don't think that's necessarily no, so. No, no, I, I I have seen the young. Yeah, yeah. It's what you're taught. It's what you taught and what you what you honor. Right. right? So, um, yeah. Yeah, I think some people maybe like leaders may not want to be called an apostle because they personally feel it's a it's a false elevation or it's yeah. in somewhere, and so they're asking you don't do that to me. Yeah. Um, and I I get that. I end up calling them apostle anyway, mm -hmm. when you know, but <laughs> you know, because it's ingrained in me. You know, yeah. I'm just like I'll I'll call it bishop, apostle, whatever. Uh, like, so, like Dave, you call him Bishop. I call him Bishop. Or and, and he, he'll elder. tell me not to. And then Does I just, he tell you not to? He used to, and I just do it oh. anyway. So, I'm going to text him like, <laughs> after this and call him Bishop. I still call. I just. I don't even say his first name. I say yeah. Bishop. <laughs> 
So. Yeah, that's Pastor Dave Williams. We love yeah. him. He's one of our apostolic elders. Right. Okay. What is your favorite topic to preach on? That's you or me? No, you. I don't know. You. Faith. Faith. There you go. Faith and identity, which I think they go together. So I, I joke around sometimes. <laughs> I tell people, I say, if you look at my messages from the last 20 years, that's how long I've been here, over 20 yeah. years, is I basically preach three or four things. But I just label them different and I package them different. But I'm, I preach on identity. I preach on faith. Uh -huh. I preach on, you know, those kind of things. And But I just package it different. Yeah, I get that. I'm like prayer, uh, intercession, supernatural, mm -hmm. prophetic. Yeah, I just kind of go in a circle. Yeah. You know, but hey, I got I got this new series, <laughs> but it's really an old one with a new name. Yeah, um, I'll answer this one here. It says, Pastor Jen, if you had to encourage prophets to be intentional in one area this year, what would it be? Good question. Wow, I a couple things. Um, what I've been seeing, and I'm really been just going to town on it, is because prof. And it says here, prophets, not prophetic people. Mm -hmm. It's a different different uh, communication but prophets in particular um, prophets carry a uh, um, weighty authority with their words and what I what I see going on right now is an attempt um, by Satan to bait you to say what he wants you to say mm. uh, rather than what God wants you to say and so um, because of social media and because of the attention it, it gets it, it gives um, prophets an instant voice um, and so because of that, there's not the processing of things that needs to happen, which mm -hmm. means you have to actually submit it to somebody or a company of no. prophets or, or your apostle, excuse me, uh, <laughs> your bishop, your apostle. Um, and, and, you know, you're going to have to get those words weighted because, um, the, because your words will produce something and yeah. you could, you potentially could produce, uh, you know, become a pulpit of, uh, of the enemy rather than the mm -hmm. pulpit of the Lord. Um, you know, and so that's why, you know, I, I was just joking yesterday, but I could see where it was going to go. You know, when the news is already saying the Asian hornet, you know, you know, and, and any prophet who understands like symbols and, and, and nature and all of that is going to instantly make this conclusion about that and perhaps spit it out. And I'm like, don't get baited by that, okay? Mm -hmm. Don't be baited because the Lord is bringing us out as a nation better than before, yeah. and, and, and we will prosper better than before. And so um, I caught that one, and I kind of made a joke about it, but I was really serious because this is what's been happening is mm -hmm. a baiting of the prophets um, to become the pulpit of the enemy rather than the pulpit yeah. of the Lord. So that's what I would say. Be very careful this year. Uh, the next thing that you need to be careful about is um, artificial intelligence. Uh, again, that stuff is real. But what what is the Lord saying about that? Because uh, yeah. the Lord gets the upper hand in that. And don't be a pulpit of the enemy. Yeah. So those are the things I would, I would caution you on. I think sometimes with that, you know, the temptation in the age of social media is mm -hmm. to be sensational. Yeah. So how can I say something to get at, garner attention? And uh, and I guess that gets really crazy. I think I think God's not called us to be sensational. He's called us to be accurate. He's called us to you know be a prophetic voice, and not try to get more you know people to watch it because we said it sensationally. And I think sometimes people just say weird things, mm -hmm. and they intentionally. It could be a true prophetic word. Again, that's just my opinion as mm -hmm. a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. It could be a true prophetic word, but they'll use verbiage to sound sens sensational or very mystical. Or, or very mystical. Yeah, it's not. It's not grounded. And it's you know, it's it just it's crazy. It so, destabilizes you, not yeah. stabilizes you. Because my thing is this, you know, for, for looking at it from a, like a pastoral or apostolic standpoint, is you know, you don't impress leaders because your word is sensational, you, you op or doors open because it's the Lord, because you have mm -hmm. accurate words. It's not about being sens sensational. Actually, this week in my devotions, I've been mm -hmm. going through the book of Jeremiah, mm -hmm. and it's interesting, over and over, the, the thing is between the prophets who say what the kings want to hear right. versus Jeremiah, who they jail him because he says what they don't want to hear. Right. And uh, so it's, yeah. You know, and but he was, but you look at that, he was always scriptural. Yeah. You know, it's like this is scripture. And that's that's where we have to bring it down to is like let's let's go back to scripture and principle mm -hmm. and that's where I'm seeing the fail in the prophets yeah. is they're overriding some stuff. Um so anyway, um what was your first supernatural experience? Are you asking me? Yes. Oh my goodness. 
so long ago. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it all depends like how you define as a, supernatural. Okay, as a Christian or as a non-Christian? That yeah. was my other question. I think mine was like four years old. You should tell that story. That's amazing. I think I was, I think I was four, maybe three. But okay. I think I was, I was four. Somewhere around that age. Yeah. yeah. This is actually when I lived in Iran still. Uh-huh. And I uh, didn't really know the Lord. I'm a four-year-old. Right. And mm-hmm. I grew up in a nominal home. But I remember mm-hmm. uh, back then I just thought it was a dream. But now the more I look back at it, I'm not so sure it was a dream. Because I remember waking up and I'm in my room. So it's not like I'm dreaming I'm someplace else. I wake up, I'm in my room just the way it is. But the ceiling opens up and I see Jesus coming mm-hmm. through it. And he basically says, come to me, come up here. Yeah. And he calls me to himself. And then I wake up, but I was still like there. So yeah. now looking back, I'm not so sure it was. But that always stuck with me. So it's weird because I don't remember that much stuff from back then. But that one at four years old always remained. To me. I mean, I could still see his face Yeah. from when that happened. So looking back, I would say that's probably my first supernatural experience of Jesus calling me at the age of four. Wow. I think when I was around that age, I was seeing demons. <laughs> so anyway, I had a totally, I was seeing Jesus. totally different experience. I was seeing demons. Uh, yeah. All right. So uh, it got better when I got saved. So anyway, <laughs> um, okay. Um, let's see. Why don't you take over? Let me ask you some questions. Well, whichever. You know. uh, how do you identify emerging leaders? See, I'll go through the leadership questions. I know, I know. Yeah. I go to the supernatural questions. Yeah. You know. How do you identify <laughs> emerging leaders? How do I identify them? Well, they're, we, I think we've, I mean, the acronym, and you've heard it before, so we'll say it again. The acronym so. is FATSO. FATSO. We're looking for the FATSO. Okay, so that it's is... Faithful. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Do you want me to answer it? Yeah, or go ahead. You, okay. I just got um, excited. Uh, so they're faithful and they're available and they're teachable. That's a big one. I always can tell where somebody's going to drop off, but when I tell them they can't do something they want me to do, um, you know, there you go. Um, teachable, spirit led, and obedient. And obedient, you know, I'm looking for them to be obedient to the Lord. You know, I'm I'm not one of those like you know I'm always one of those people like you always have a choice and you, you know what I'm saying. This is what, how I'd like you to do it though. Um, whereas if if we're more in a staff relationship, I, I have I have more expectation there. But but um, uh, you know, and I, I I look for that. And you know what's really awesome is is that there are people who are all around me that are emerging. I all around me, I just uh, you know. Um, letting time work for them and not rushing and letting God open the door. And and I am actually seeing that heart and attitude in many yeah. people right now that I'm working with. And it's been it's been pleasant to me. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's the thing. It's fat. So mm-hmm. is, uh, you know, being like I, I think it was last week or the week before. I can't remember which Q&A because we've done so many of them now. I know. Uh, <laughs> but in one of the Q&A's we're talking about. <laughs> You know, being faithful, and which just means at times being around. You know, I, th- I think that there's times where people are like, well, it's a big church, you know, and uh, mm-hmm. how do I get in? And so, right. well, if you're just around, no church is ever too big. Uh, That's true. If you're around, you emerge because just your faithfulness mm-hmm. of constantly being there and um, getting involved, <laughs> getting getting help when you always do that. <laughs> getting help when there is, you know, helping when there is something that needs to happen and and you know, just just being faithful with what's given to you, and then if you're given a responsibility, do it with excellence. Do it the best you can. Right. Be trustworthy. Uh, I think if you just demonstrate that over time, and you have to remember, time is what elevates you. When your gift elevates you, rather than your faithfulness elevates you, sometimes your character isn't developed for the platform you're given because of your gift and then it's going to crush you. Mm-hmm. So I, if you allow your faithfulness, which is your character, to develop at the same time, I think, um, you know, and, oh, and one of, and you hit on this too, is, mm-hmm. is uh, when your leader either does something you don't agree with or tells you no, is can you serve well still mm-hmm. and still be faithful mm-hmm. and not let it affect you in the sense of your attitude and all that kind of stuff. You mean not Facebook, Facebook process then? Facebook process or, we, fa- or face talk. I hate yeah. face talking, <laughs> which I guess I do it too and I don't realize. Everybody yeah. face talks. Everybody face talks. <laughs> so in other words, you know, you're, you're saying something with your face, but your words like, oh, no, I'm good. I'm good, but your face says something. I know. So, uh, but and I said this in my, 
my manual. My ma my user manual is out uh -huh. now. It's it's out. It's been published. So Jen has a copy now, so she knows how to deal with me. So, um, but you know, like in there, I talk about. I rewrote a couple things. Well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you wrote it. But uh, it's uh, in there. I talk about you know when we're leaders. When you get to a place in leadership, we don't get here because we don't know how to read people. Yeah. So just be honest, and it's okay if you don't like something that's. You know your leader said to you, or gonna, you know, it's okay. And if you can't let it go, go process it with them. That's not a big deal. But it's it's the fakeness that causes. Yeah. So if you're fake around your leaders, it'll cause your leaders not to trust you. But they don't know why they don't trust you. Yeah. There's just this feeling I don't trust them. I don't know. I don't. And, and it's because they're not connecting with your heart. And it could be yeah. as just simple as you not being honest. Yeah. And uh, because sometimes as leaders we get this. Th thing in our sphere is like, oh, I don't trust them. I'm not sure why. And but, but we don't know why. It could be as simple as you're not being honest right now with what's happening in your life or what you're yeah. sensing. Because, you know, connection with everybody, but with your mm -hmm. leaders is heart to heart. So I'm like yeah. like an unveiled heart um, with my leaders and, and, and everything. And so, yeah. you know. <laughs> okay, how, do you well, measure, how do you measure the health of your church? Okay. I think that's a good question. Let's so make the last question. How would you do that? Okay. How do you measure... The health of your church. Um, well, we want to pick a different one since it's the last question. Uh, I don't. I don't have. Okay, let's do this one. It would be one? better. Uh, how do you decide what no longer is working in ministry, what needs to be trimmed or discontinued, and how do you gauge this? Well, I am const for me, and he's even even way more than I am. But I'm constantly tinkering and looking at things and how to do things better, um, and and so. In, in that sense, um, things are always evolving, and I, I don't have a problem mm -hmm. killing something. I, you know, I, I'm not like really uh, the type of person that has to keep some sort of ministry going, mm -hmm. and I'm constantly looking at it and say, okay, is this barren fruit? Is this barren fruit? Um, is this efficient? Uh, you know, and when it, start, it, when it stops bearing fruit, and when it stops being efficient, yeah. or it's not, um, it's not moving with uh, technology. You know the way mm -hmm. the way that everything is moving. Then I'm evaluating it to kill it. <laughs> so. Yeah, and I, same thing. I think that's the yeah. number one thing I look at. Uh, the thing I have to watch out for. I'm being self-aware enough with mm -hmm. is because I'm a visionary, so I could easily get bored with something, and um, you know, so I, I love starting things, launching things. And like, for example, when we do a building program, which we're always doing one, uh, when it's about 75% done, I'm already at the next one. Yeah. So, um, so with, when it comes to ministry, I have to make sure it's, I'm not gauging it with, oh, well, I'm just, we're already doing this. Mm -hmm. It has to be with fruitfulness. But the second part of that is also, number one, if it's fruitful. So many times we keep ministries or we keep things going just because we've always done it that way or because so-and-so leads it and we don't want to make them feel bad, like us killing mm. it. No, you have to kill it. Um, if it's not bearing fruit, Jesus even talked about it. you got to prune it so that it could bear fruit. So sometimes it could mean pruning the leadership. Sometimes it means pruning the entire ministry. But I think the second part of that, what I gauge with, is how much drag is it causing on the organization? Yeah. All right, how much drag is it causing? So in other words, uh, it might have some fruit, but it's causing, but you have to put so much energy mm -hmm. into it that's causing the entire body to slow down. So I think a few years ago, we went through our, our church, our organization, and we cut a whole bunch of stuff. Like practically everything seemed nah. like, no, I'm, I'm exaggerating. Just a lot. We, we cut, cut a lot, a lot of lot. stuff. And the reason I did that was, I, I think the Lord gave me this revelation one day, mm -hmm. is uh, we had become fat. We had become fat as an organization. <laughs> and maybe because I was fat or I'm fat, <laughs> so the Lord used that to speak to me. But, but it was kind of like one of those things of we had all this stuff going on. At the end of the day, <laughs> oh, yeah. at the end of the day, uh, we didn't have the energy to do anything new, right? Remember, I kept, I kept complaining. I'm like, every September, we have 30 announcements each yeah. and every Sunday. <laughs> because so we have so much going on. So much. So what was happening was then, and here's another way you, you know that you're, you need to cut some stuff. When a new idea comes to you or the Lord speaks to you about something, and your first thought is, oh, that's great, but I just don't have the energy, mm. or you don't have the bandwidth, that says you got too much fat going on. So my whole thing was, we got so much fat that at the end of the day, we don't have the energy to do the things we want to do uh -huh. because we're carrying the fat that we've had 
we've put on all these over the years. Yeah. So at the end, so if you could, if you could trim the fat, at the end of the day, you actually have energy to do the things you want to do, and and be more effective. Right. You know, ministry is not designed for you at the end of the day to be all worn out. Right. Right. I, I really value you know the lean, mean efficiency machine. That's that's yeah. I hate to use the word machine, but there there is some you know structural yeah. components with ministry and. Um, and you have to remember, ministry at the end of the day is about reaching people. Yeah, it it's is. It's about being effective. Mm -hmm. I think uh, sometimes ministry becomes, it's a, it's a family, so we all hang out. But then sometimes when a family member is not producing fruit, whether it could be a staff, it could be a ministry leader, it mm -hmm. could be yourself. Yeah. If you're not producing fruit, uh, of course, I'm not talking about just cutting people off. Of course, you know, it's you, a family. You've got to work, you gotta you gotta work, work with, with people. people. But at the end of the day, for the sake of not hurting one person's feelings, we don't reach thousands of people who are waiting to be reached because we just don't want to hurt one mm. person's feelings or mm -hmm. one person wants to control or, or things like that. Yeah. So at the end of the day, Jesus is very interested in fruit. Mm -hmm. When you look at the Gospels, over and over he talks about fruitfulness and, and uh, bearing fruit. And Jesus is very interested in fruit. Even with, I'll finish with this, even with okay. the fig tree, mm -hmm. it says Jesus rebuked the fig tree, uh, fig tree my Syrian accent's coming out. Uh, uh, tired? No, I'm talking <laughs> fast. In, in uh, Mark chapter 11, uh, when you, but when you read that passage, say he cursed it from his roots up where it dried up. But it says that he got mad because he went to get fruit from it when it was not the season of figs. So think about it. Jesus got upset, cursed the fig tree when it wasn't even the fig season. <laughs> I don't know. Again, I don't get it. There's more to it than that, but I think there's a prophetic thing in that to say, mm -hmm. in whatever season Jesus expects fruit. Yeah, whatever true. season you're in, Jesus expects fruit. Okay. Yeah. All Pray. Right. So, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you are bursting us out of our confinements right. and bringing us into open spaces, and and we are following you. And Lord, we ask you for the things. Um, that mm. that we desire, you, you said you have not because you ask not, and so That's we're right. going to ask for what we want. And Lord, we want our our churches open, yeah. we want our businesses open, we want our yes. schools open, we want our graduations. Yeah. We we thank you, Lord, that you are you have spoken, and we are mm -hmm. coming out better than before. And we thank you, Lord, that you are raising a standard in the nations, right. Lord. You said when the enemy comes in like a flood, that you will raise a standard yes. against him. And so, Lord, we ask and thank yeah. you for the Absolutely. standard being raised up against the enemy. And, Lord, that you are blessing yeah. the nations, That's the right. nations that you sure. that you sent Jesus to die for. He'll get what he paid for. Yeah. And we thank you, Lord, thank in your you, Lord. name. Amen. Amen. All right. We'll see you guys next week. Okay. Bye.